Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you, yes you, make your game dev dreams become a reality. Today's part 11 of the AI series where we're going to implement state machines. State machines are a way to control the behavior of your AI. What we had before was a really simplistic, just always do this one thing AI, which I would say falls on the category of the if then else programming model for your AI. And that's totally fine for games where you have really simplistic needs on your AI. Like you want your AI to always follow the player. You can do it that way and you don't need any additional complexity on your AI. If you're making a game where you do need additional behaviors and complexity in your AI behavior, then state machines are the next level up from there. There are other types of AI modeling behavior like decision trees and you can even use ML to teach that's machine learning to teach your AI how to move around and how to behave in different scenarios. We're not getting into those yet. We're starting with the state machine because it's like level two in the behavioral modeling. And what we're going to do in this one is have three states. We're going to have the idle state where the navmesh agent will just idly walk around without any real aim on the navmesh until they gain line of sight on the player. The other state where they can be in by default is going to be the patrol state. And if you've played a real-time strategy game before, you know you can always set up a set of waypoints for your units to patrol on, and they'll just go in a circle on those until something comes by to disrupt them. It's going to be the same thing in this one. Our agents will pick the waypoints instead of the user defining them, and they'll just walk between those points on the nav mesh until they gain line of sight on the player. Both of those states, once they gain line of sight of the player, they will start entering the other state, which is chase. That's what we've already implemented, so you're familiar with that one. It will just start following the player until they lose line of sight by the player going too far away. Once that happens, they're going to return to the previous state they were in, which would either be the idle or the patrol state. If they were in patrol, they will go back to the last waypoint that they were just trying to get to. Once we've implemented all of this, we'll configure it with the scriptable object. That way we have not a separate video to do scriptable objects again, because we're going to make sure we do it at the time of implementation this time. Let's go ahead and implement them. We're going to make two new scripts under the enemy folder, the enemy state and an enemy line of sight checker. We'll start with enemy state. We'll make it a public enum instead of a public class, and it will not extend the mono behavior. We'll have four values here, the spawn, idle, patrol, and chase. Spawn is kind of a default that we want the state to be that will have no action associated with it. It's kind of like the entry state. The rest of them I described in the intro. Idle, they will just wander around. Patrol, they will walk between some waypoints. And chase is what we've already implemented, where they follow the player. We'll open up the enemy movement next. We'll create a public enemy state state property field, where we'll provide the get and set functions inside, because we want to be able to have an event raised whenever we set the value. of. So I'll do get, which just returns underscore state. That's the backing field. And whenever we set it, we're going to set the backing field value to be whatever the value is. Then we'll create a public delegate void state change event that accepts the old state and the new state. We'll then create a property field of that state change event, public state change event on state change. And whenever we set the value of state, right before we do that, we will trigger the on state change event with on state change question mark dot invoke underscore state, which is the old state, and then value, which is the new state. The question mark dot invoke makes it so that way if on state change for any reason is unassigned, it's like a null check built in. It's just the shorthand syntax for that. And we invoke the delegate function with the underscore state, the old state, and the value, which is the new state. And then we set the value of state to be whatever the new value of state should be. And we'll add one more state, the public enemy state default state. That way we have the default state that we want the enemy movement to use to move around. I'll scroll down a little bit and make the public void on disable magic unity function. And in here, we're going to set the backing field to the default state. We're not going to set the uppercase state because that will trigger the on state change and we actually don't want that to happen. We want it to force it to be the default state. That way anybody who's subscribed to the on state change doesn't get a callback whenever we're reverting back to the initial state. And just below that, we're gonna rename the start chasing function to be called spawn because instead of always having our enemies 
start chasing, what we're going to do is make them get spawned and we'll set up whatever needs to happen after they've spawned in here. And for right now, all we're going to do is say on state change and we'll say that they spawned and then they'll transition to the default state. On awake, what we'll do is add a function to our delegate on state change called handle state change. And in this function, we're going to handle all of those state changes. This is our state machine management function, basically. So I'll scroll down to the bottom and add a private void handle state change that again takes the old state and the new state. And then we'll check in there if the old state is not the new state, then we'll do something. If we're changing for some reason from our old state to our same state, we're not going to do anything there. I'll check if the follow coroutine is not null. If it is not null, we'll stop it. And then I'll do a switch on the new state where I'll set up the defaults here. So case enemy state idle, break, case enemy state patrol, break, and then case enemy state chase. In that one, what we'll do is assign the follow coroutine to start coroutine follow target. So that way, whenever we enter in this chase state, we'll do exactly what we did before and start following the player. So let's quickly hop back to the Unity editor, select the basic enemy prefab and set the default state to be chase and then change the enemy manager to only spawn one enemy so that way we only get the one basic enemy just so we can tell what's going on a little bit easier and then click play we'll see that the enemy spawns and starts chasing me just like they did before there's absolutely no change to what's happening right now so with what we have at this point we've implemented a state machine that performs the exact same as what we had already but that's not particularly interesting so let's come in and start on the next state the idle state the way we're going to implement the idle movement around is we're going to make the enemy choose a location near them to start walking to and once they get close enough to that position they'll just pick another location that's somewhere near wherever they are. This way they're not picking random places that are really far away on the nav mesh. They'll kind of have a more random path on where they're going. And I'll also give them a move speed multiplier to make them go slower in this state because they don't know where they're going they're just kind of wandering. To achieve that we're going to have a public float idle location radius and that's the radius from the agent that will select a random location in. So we'll be picking a random location within four units of this enemy. I'll also make that public float idle move speed multiplier and set that to be 0.5 by default We move half as fast. We'll then scroll down to the handle state change. In the case of enemy state idle, we'll first check if old state is equal to idle. If it is, we'll take the agent speed and divide equals idle move speed multiplier. And what that does is the inverse of what we're going to implement in the do idle motion function, which this will reset the agent speed to be whatever they're supposed to move at. Let's say that we have agent speed is one. If we multiplied that by 0.5 to get back to one, we would divide by 0.5. So then we'll go into the switch. The case of enemy state idle, we'll assign the follow coroutine to start coroutine do idle motion. And real quick, before we implement that, I'm going to cut and paste the follow target coroutine down to the bottom. We're going to have all the motions be below the handle state change function just for some organization. So once I move that down, I'll create the do idle motion coroutine private I enumerator do idle motion. And in here, we will create a new wait for seconds using the update rate, the same as we did for follow target. We will then take the agent dot speed and multiply equal that by the idle move speed multiplier. Then we'll make the while loop. So while true, if the agent is not enabled or the agent is not on a nav mesh, we're just going to yield return a wait. That way, if for some reason the agent is not on the mesh, maybe they are on an off mesh link, something like that, we'll wait until they are on there and then we'll set the destination. Else if the agent remaining distance is less than or equal to the agent stopping distance, so if they're within the range that they should be to the point, then we'll generate a new point for them to go to. And we'll do that by doing vector2 point equals random dot inside unit circle. This is the Unity Engine random instance. They provide this inside unit circle. So unit circle right is a circle with a radius of one and it's going to pick a random point inside of that and then we're going to multiply that by the idle location radius that way we get in our example here a four we'll get a unit circle times four and pick something random inside of there then we'll do nav mesh dot sample position from the agent transform position plus the random point that we got on the x and z axis so that's plus new vector three point dot x zero on the y and point dot y for the z because we don't want it to go up or down we want it to be on the nav mesh because nav mesh is planar right then we'll set the out to be the nav mesh hit i'm picking a radius of like two and we'll provide the agent area mask so that way we're only sampling locations that this agent can walk and then we'll set the destination if we've correctly sampled the position based on the hit position and at the end of this we'll just yield return the weight let's hop back to the unity editor to test it out we'll change the basic enemy to use idle as their default state and if I go find that enemy, we'll see they're kind of just wandering around. 
you can see if I select the navigation window that they're picking a random location, that's this red circle, that's their target destination, and there's moving around towards that. If I quickly come in here and create a sphere as a child of that and set the radius to be four, the same as our idle radius, and let me let them pick a new spot real fast. Yep, we'll see that this one is actually really close to the edge. So any the agent will always pick a location that is on the same plane as they are currently, so on this nav mesh, within this sphere radius. Now let's start implementing the patrolling. I'll make a private int waypoint index to make that serialized so I can see it in the inspector. I'll make a private vector 3 array of waypoints and I'll set that to be a new vector 3 of size 4. I'll also add a public nav mesh triangulation triangulation and I'll assign that from the enemy spawner later because I don't want each enemy to have to recalculate the triangulation after the enemy spawner has calculated it to spawn agent. Then the spawn function I'm going to loop over those waypoints so for int i equals 0 i less than waypoints length I++. Plus plus. I'll declare a nav mesh hit variable and say if nav mesh dot sample position again triangulation dot vertices random range from zero to triangulation vertices length that's the same thing we did whenever we were spawning nav mesh agents we'll put the out to be the hit and I'll sample around two units around this vertice using the agent's area mass and if we hit something which we should in all cases we'll take the waypoint I and assign that to be the hit position. And we'll log an error if we could not, for some reason, find a position within two units of that. And I'll go down to the handle state change, and under the enemy state patrol case, we'll say follow coroutine equals start coroutine do patrol motion. Then let's make that coroutine function, that's private I enumerator do patrol motion. I'll make another wait for seconds wait, wait for seconds with the update rate. We will set the agent destination to the waypoints at the waypoint index. So the first time we do this waypoint index will be zero, so we'll hit the first waypoint. And again, we'll put while true if the agent is on a nav mesh and the agent's enabled, and the remaining distance is less than or equal to the stopping distance, then we'll increment the waypoint index. We'll check if we've gone out of bounds of the waypoint array. If we have, we set the waypoint index back to zero, and then we set the agent destination to be whatever waypoint index we're at now, and yield return wait. One more thing we need to do before we move on from this is wait until the agent is enabled and on the nav mesh. If an agent's on a link or something like that, as we did before in the do idle motion, they might not be ready to receive us setting this destination and we'll get an error log to the console. So before we set the agent destination, before we enter that while loop, I'll do a yield return, wait until agent.enabled and agent is on nav mesh. So what that does is every frame it checks if the agent's enabled and is on the nav mesh. And if it is not, then we're still waiting and it'll check again on the next frame. One more thing I'm gonna do just so we can visualize where the agents are gonna go is we're gonna implement the private void on draw gizmos selected. So whenever I select a nav mesh agent, we'll draw in the editor where all their waypoints are. So we'll do for int i equals zero, i less than waypoints link, incrementing i by one. We'll do gizmos, uh, draw wire sphere, waypoints i, and 0.25 for the radius. So that's going to draw a wire sphere at the waypoint location, and it'll be relatively small. We'll check if i plus 1 is less than the waypoint's length, and if it is, then we'll do a gizmos.draw line from the current waypoint to the next waypoint. In the other case where we're at the last one, we will draw a line from the current one to the first one, so that way we have all of them connected. And the last thing for this is we need to go back to the enemy spawner, and assign the enemy.movement.triangulation to be the triangulation that we already calculated on this class. So if I hop back to the Unity editor, set the basic enemy to be on the patrol, we can see the gizmos are drawn where there's these little white wire spheres with lines going through them. So we can see the agent runs to the first one, turns around and starts heading to the second one, moves on towards the third one, which is upstairs, and then eventually he's going to go to that other one. So that's great, we have the patrol, but none of these guys will ever change out of their state, right? We've implemented default states only, but there's no way for them to actually move from whatever state to another state. That's what we're gonna do next is do the enemy line of sight checker, where the enemy will check if they have line of sight of the player. If they do, 
then they'll break out of their state and go into the chase state until they lose line of sight. Let's open the enemy line of sight checker. We'll require component type of sphere collider and put a public sphere collider collider at the top. We'll also add public float field of view and I'll set that to 90 by default. And that'll be how many degrees in front of the agent that they can see. We'll also add the public layer mask line of sight layer. Then we're gonna create two delegate functions, a public delegate void gain sight event and have that take a player and we'll make a public gain sight event on gain sight. We'll do the exact same thing for a lose sight event, a public delegate void lose sight event also accepts a player. You could probably make this where it's just a sight event, but I wanted to be explicit on the event type in case we needed to change that later, that the gain sight event and lose sight event are actually different types. In this example though, you could use just maybe a public delegate void sight event that has a player and call on gain sight and on lose sight whenever those events happen and you get the exact same behavior. We'll also make a private coroutine check for line of sight coroutine. That way we can manage stopping and starting this later. On awake, we'll assign the collider by a collider equals get component sphere collider. We'll also implement the private void on trigger enter collider other. In here, declare player player and we'll check if other dot try get component player out player. So that tries to get the component of player. If it exists, it will return true and populate the player variable with that player reference. And we'll say if not check line of sight to the player, then we will start checking for line of sight. So we'll do check for line of sight coroutine equals start coroutine check for line of sight. We haven't made either of those yet. We'll get there in a second. But what we're doing here is checking if we have line of sight to a player. If we do not immediately when they enter, then we start a coroutine that will check for the line of sight every so often. Let's implement the on trigger exit, so the inverse of the enter before we get into the line of sight checking. So on trigger exit, we're gonna do almost the same thing where we do player player if other dot try get component player out player. In this case, we will conditionally invoke the on lose sight function if it's exit if it's not null. So that's on lose sight question mark dot invoke player, and we'll check if the check for line of sight coroutine is not null. If it's not, we'll stop it. Then we'll implement the check checking for a line of sight function. We'll make that check for line of sight function with private bool check line of sight that accepts a player. In there we'll get the direction vector between the player and this agent. That's the vector three direction equals player.transform.position minus transform.position.normalize. And to check the line of sight, what we'll do first is if vector three dot that accepts transform.forward and the direction vector, and we check if that is greater than or equal to mathf.cosine the field of view. Vector three dot is the dot product of two vectors and what that produces is a float value equal to the magnitude of two vectors multiplied together and then multiplied by the cosine of the angle between them. If that doesn't really mean anything to you, that's okay. What this is doing is taking the enemy transforms forward and the direction vector that's between the enemy and the player and giving us a value between negative one and one indicating where the player is relative to the nav mesh agent where negative one is directly behind the agent and positive one is directly in front of the agent to demonstrate this a little bit more clearly Take a look at this video. Since we're using a 90 degree field of view here, as the player walks around, you'll see that the number on top of the enemy changes from green to red. That indicates whether the dot product is greater than the math f dot cosine value. So when the player is in front of the enemy, it's green. And as soon as they go a little bit past 180 degrees, you see that it turns red. So that negative 0.424 is the cutoff point for this. This visualization made it a lot easier for me to understand what the vector three dot product was actually giving and understand how it works a little bit better. So if the dot product tells us that we are in front of the agent within their line of sight radius, then we'll declare a raycast hit and do a raycast to see if there's anything obstructing our vision there. So we'll do if physics raycast transform.position, we'll pass in the direction that we already calculated instead of recalculating it. We'll put the raycast hit and the out hit, provide the collider radius for the how far the raycast should go, and use the line of sight layers to do any filtering. If that returns true, meaning we hit something, we'll check if the hit.transform.get component player is not null. So if we've hit a player, with our raycast, then we do have line of sight. So we will invoke the on gain sight event and return true. In all other cases, we're gonna return false because that means we do not have line of sight. They're either behind us or there's something obstructing our vision. 
The last thing to do here is implement the check for line of sight coroutine. That's private I enumerator check for line of sight, which accepts the player. We'll create a wait for seconds wait that waits for 0.1 seconds. I arbitrarily made this up because we don't want to check for line of sight every frame that's relatively expensive. So I'm putting 0.1. We'll do while not check for line of sight player yield return wait. So we're going to execute that check for line of sight and if it's true, we will stop running this coroutine. And remember that the check line of sight function also invokes the on gain sight, so we don't need to do anything if it does return true. That's it for the enemy line of sight checker. Let's hop back to the enemy movement at a public enemy line of sight checker, line of sight checker. And on awake, we'll assign the on gain site and on lose site events to handle gain site and handle lose site respectively. I'll make those two functions handle gain site player, player. And in that case, we will set the state to be enemy state chase. On the handle lose site function, which is private void handle lose site, I'm going to reset the state to the default state. That way they'll go back to whatever they were doing before. If they were idle, they'll go back to being idle. If they're patrolling, they'll go back to following their patrol. Now we need to add the enemy line of sight checker into our prefabs. So I'll open up the basic enemy. I'm just gonna duplicate the attack radius because it needs to be basically the same. And attach the enemy line of sight checker script to that. And I'll set the radius to be something like six. The field of view I'm gonna leave at 90. It seems like a pretty good value. And on the line of sight layers, I'm gonna set it up to be default and player. So that way it'll still collide with the world geometry and the player. So that because we want it to be obstructed by world geometry, right? Then I'll hook up the line of sight radius to the line of sight checker in the enemy movement. And because I copy pasted the attack radius, this is already on the correct layer. The physics layers here are important because we want the on trigger enter and on trigger exit to be triggered as few times as possible only when a player comes into the radius. So the attack rate, enemy attack radius is the perfect layer for this to be on. If I then click play, we can see our enemies patrolling between these four points. And if I move my player where this enemy will gain line of sight to me, let's just get right here. We'll see that she does start chasing me because she gained line of sight to me. We set it up where she doesn't stop chasing as soon as she loses line of sight. She only stops chasing when I move out of range of her line of sight radius. So that's that six unit sphere collider that we put in there. This makes it so she, the enemies are not gonna, as soon as you round a corner, stop following you because that's they, they give up way too easy, right? In your game, you probably want them to be a little bit more sticky to their player. Now that we've seen that that's actually working the way that we thought it was gonna work, I'm gonna open up all of the enemy prefabs and set up the enemy line of sight checker for all of them. The ranged and the tall enemies should all inherit that correctly. So I'm gonna open up the flying enemy and do basically the same thing there. I'm gonna configure the melee enemies, so the basic and the tall enemies to be walking around idly, and I'll have the ranged enemies do a patrol. So that's gonna be the ranged enemy and the flying enemy. If I then click play, a bunch of these guys spawn really close to me, so let me go run away. I'll try to get as far away as possible so I break the line of sight with all of them. Let's see what's going on. There's one on top. That's okay, I think we'll get out of their range. Yep, everybody seems to be working okay. There's a lot of movement here because everyone's kind of doing their own thing. They're doing the patrol and the idle moving around and it looks pretty lively. Let's configure all of these state mechanics in the enemy scriptable object. We'll create a public float idle location radius and set that to four by default, a public float idle move speed multiplier, 0.5 by default, a public int waypoints, that's gonna be the number of waypoints that we'll use whenever we're doing the patrol. And I'll set that to be a range from two to 10 and four by default. We'll do a public float line of sight range, 6F by default, and of course also the field of view, which would be 90 by default. We also need to set up the default state. So I'll do a public enemy state default state. And once we have all of these available, we'll set up the enemy movement from these values. So in the setup enemy function, we'll do enemy.movement.default state equals default state. The same for idle move speed multiplier. 
idle location radius, and waypoints, but remember waypoints actually we made private. So I'll quickly hop over to the enemy movement, change it from the private vector 3 waypoints to be a public vector 3 array waypoints. That way we can set it up from the setup enemy function. So we'll do the movement.waypoints equals new vector3 array of size waypoints. Then for the line of sight checker configurations, we'll do enemy.movement.line of sight checker dot field of view collider radius and line of sight layers are equal to the field of view, line of sight range, and the attack configuration dot line of sight layers. So we're going to use the same line of sight layers that we use on the attack configuration for the line of sight checker. Now that we can configure these enemies, let's configure them with the scriptable objects. We'll open up the basic enemy scriptable objects at the waypoints to be 2 because we're not going to use it. We'll make it a little bit faster to spawn them. Set the default state to idle, and I think we're going to leave everything else alone. We do need to update their attack configuration so that way they can correctly check for line of sight because we're using the attack configuration line of sight layers for more than just ranged enemy attacking now. For the flying enemy, we'll set them to be a default state of patrol. I'll increase their waypoint count to be 6 so that way they have a little bit more dynamic movement pattern and increase their line of sight range to be 10 because they're flying they should be able to see farther. On the homing ranged enemy, I'll set the default state to be patrol as well. I'll leave the waypoints at 4 for them, but I'll increase their line of sight to be 7.5 so it's slightly longer than their attack range, and I'll do the exact same thing for the ranged enemy. If we do the tall enemy, I'll set the default state for them to be idle, but I'll increase their line of sight range to be 8 so it's a little bit longer since they're taller, and also increase the field of view to something like 120 so they have a little bit more leniency on gaining line of sight. I also need to update their attack configuration to include the default and player layer because before I never set that up because it was not used for the melee enemies. And that should be it. If I click play, I'll select all of the enemies so that way we can see all of their waypoints. We see that the flying enemy has six waypoints configured. This ranged one that's already attacking me has a little bit of difference between their line of sight and their range attack. I'm at the edge of their line of sight right now. This basic enemy we see only has two waypoints because they're idly walking around, and the tall enemy has a pretty large line of sight radius. I hope you got a lot of value out of today's video and you understand how to implement a basic state machine into your game to manage your AI's behavior. If you have been getting value out of this video or the series, please consider liking and subscribing to help the channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. If you have any questions, if you have a suggestion for a topic, or if you're implementing AI into your game, drop a comment down below and I'll see you on the next video.